today we're uh, we're all here to talk about uh, a manual settings workshop, right? Hopefully, everybody's in the right place. Uh, so the there are lots of benefits to shooting in manual mode. In fact, if you're in college learning about photography and you do not use manual mode, if you stick to the presets and all of the autos and all that stuff, uh, you're doing yourself a great disservice. You're, you're losing out quite a bit. The greatest benefit to shooting in manual is that it gives you control over everything. Control is your best friend when you're shooting photography. Having control of the light is kind of like being God for one frame at a time. So the most important thing about photography, does anybody know what that is? It's real easy. Think simple. The most important thing about photography. Taking the shot. The little finger, yeah. No. Capturing the moment. Very, it's getting there. Think simple. Think, just forget everything you ever learned and think, think like a baby would think about photography. So basically express what you see through the camera lens. That's what you're, you're thinking way too it's deep. <laughs> Boom, light, light. No light, no picture, right? Makes sense. So the next time you go out and you use your camera, you need to start thinking in way different terms. You need to think in terms of where is the light? Where's it coming from? What's it doing? How's it bouncing off the scene, right? How is it coloring the scene? In here, it's making, if, if right now I've got like an auto white balance set on here, for just making me look green. So I'm gonna have to do like some kind of post processing here. Human eyes look at every temperature of light kind of the same. We have the ability to <clears throat> adjust to 2800 Kelvin light, which is the color rated temperature for fluorescent or 56K, which is the color rated Kelvin temperature for the sun or higher or even lower than all of those. We have a, a wider range than any camera to date has the ability to um, regenerate electronically. They're getting close. Uh, anybody ever heard of raw? Raw photography? Yeah? What is raw photography? Raw is a sound file that captures the whole uh, depth of light, the whole Yeah, well, yeah, you can, you can use it more easily in Photoshop. Uh, the, 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 the word that you used there that I really like, thank you so much, I will let you hang out and stop exercising now. Uh, hopefully you use the elevator, right? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Maybe too bad. So the use, the use of the word whole in that sentence is, is key. So capturing all of it. And I don't mean like every single thing that's out in front of the camera. I just mean all of the raw data. It doesn't matter what is out there when the shutter trips and goes up and lets that light hit the sensor for that umpt of a second, for that tiny measurement of a second, and then closes back down. It just captures all of the data. There's no compression. Well, there still kind of is compression, but that's a technical discussion. We'll just say for our purposes, there's no compression. It doesn't make it into a JPEG. It doesn't make it into a TIFF, which is, largely uncompressed. It doesn't make it into some other <clears throat> ping file or you know, any, any of those you know, GIF and funny little internet uh, formats and stuff. It just captures raw data, which makes for excellent ability to edit for those of us that really like to get into the editing, pro editing process, but um, it makes huge files, huge, huge, huge files. It captures all the densities of light from the lowest to the highest of, on the spectrum. Uh, it captures uh, the, the, the widest range, and lately it's, been, it's started to be used in movies. And they've, uh, uh, cameras like the C500, the Canon C500, and way back in 2009 they shot a movie called uh, District 9 with a camera make, the, the make is called Red, and the camera was the one, it was the very first one that shot all digital raw. And if anybody remember that movie, District 9, it's about aliens in South Africa 
really creepy movie. If you watch it, it's, it's shot in all raw and uh, 60p. It's edgy, it's sharp, it's like, uh, you know, you can, you can count the little specks of dust that fly across the screen when a gunshot hits the dirt or something. Uh, mov movies like that, uh, shots like that are, are best captured in raw. So I'm starting that discussion to say that we're gonna talk about a full range of things. If your camera does shoot in raw, do that and do so in manual because you'll be able to do all kinds of stuff with it that other people won't be able to do when you get to the editing bay, right? Now that I've prepared you with that super overinflated discussion of stuff we don't know yet. <clears throat> so the benefits are you, the, the, the more control, basically, uh, is, is what you kind of want to, uh, restating that uh, from before, really. Uh, having control over the, over the aspects and how the light reacts to the camera, how the camera reacts to the light, that's the, um, that and the, the better ability to enhance the image aesthetic. There are lots of ways that you can enhance the image aesthetic by being able to focus at a certain point rather than the whole scene. Auto takes over all of that stuff for you and it says, I guess you want to shoot this thing over here. And you're like, no man, I want to shoot that thing over here. And you like get into this little tech battle with your own camera. Can't figure it out. Raw puts you in the driver's seat, right? <clears throat> Gives you a stronger ability to shoot into the light, if that's what you need to do, or into things that bounce off the light, or shoot looking into the water, right? It gives your camera the ability to use filters, like, um, that sort of optimize the scene. You can have ionizers, which, which would kind of clear the sheen off the surface of things, like I'm shooting into a car. Like uh, you're shooting a documentary and, and your, your subject is in there and is talking and you don't want to see like what the sky looks like instead of what's being said. Right? Uh, if you want to shoot fish underwater and there's a reflection on the surface, there's all kinds of stuff that you can change. Uh, the three main contributing factors to the manual mode are the f-stop, otherwise known as aperture, ISO, or back in, back in the day where I was learning film, APA, uh, ISO actually stands for the International Standards Organization, and they, they, they cover the, all of the stuff involved in uh, how sensors are rated. Very popular guys in Silicon Valley. And the third factor is shutter speed. So the aperture of the camera is how wide the iris is. What is an iris? Hmm? What's an iris in your eye? The black spot. Yep, black spot in the middle. That increases and decreases in size, doesn't it? When you look into the sun, it goes And when it's nighttime, we can all do this experiment, probably, probably everybody did this experiment back in junior high school, where everybody says, look into your neighbor's eyes, and then it's shooting <laughs> off the lights. It got all creepy for about four to eight seconds until the lights came back on, and then everybody went mm -hmm. Right, up with their irises squeezed up on them. That's technically what they call the inside of the, uh, the blades of that lens opening and shutting. All right? When you change the aperture, that's what you're doing. You're, you're closing and shutting the blades of the inside of the camera. No. <laughs> All right, so usually a camera has an odd number of blades inside the lens. Each lens has its own set of blades, right? And they just look like this. It's a horrible shot or drawing of what that is, but basically that, that's kind of what the inside looks like. Oh, we'll do this a little better. This is an easier way to draw it. Right, that's a little bit better. Now you can see. Is it going to raise that? Probably not. Okay. And that, that's what the inside of your lens looks like. Except it's all black. Right? These blades, just all they do is they turn in and out. And the farther in they turn, the closer that hole gets to the center. Right? That's it. So an aperture is measured from the outer edge of the, the lens, the opening of the lens, to the outer edge of the iris. I bet we've taken that glass, haven't we? We probably have. That's the only thing left to mess up, right? <laughs> Yeah, let's find out if we're going to hijack some poor guy's class. Mm. 
technology affects every as aspect of our lives these days, doesn't it? Uh, so, uh, where was I? So the outer edge of the lens, which is right here, to the outer edge of the iris. This right here is what's being measured in the f-stop. All right, f-stop or aperture. All right, so the aperture of the camera is how wide the iris is. We talked about the measurement of the outer edge of the iris toward the outer edge. Uh, it's, it's actually not how wide the inside is. Like, that's the whole point. It's, it's how wide or how thin, actually, the, the measurement of the inside of the blade to the outside of the lens. So as the iris increases, that number actually gets smaller. Your f-stop gets smaller. Everybody get that? All right. The reason that they did that uh, is because the, in, the inner area um, of the iris is a little bit different from camera to camera. So that couldn't be the standard. A as is the, the, the distance between the outside of the lens and the iris, right? But the one factor that always remains true is the actual distance between the outer edge of the iris and the inner edge of the lens. It's always a constant. Any more light that goes in, uh, it goes into, it's basically the Germans kind of figured out this algorithm, mathematical algorithm, when they were refining uh, how the camera works and, and interchangeable lenses and stuff in the very early days of the uh, camera function. Uh, but you can read about that in history class. The bigger the number, uh, the smaller the opening, the smaller the opening, the, the bigger the number. Right? Uh, the, the more light, right? I said that backwards. I did. Bigger the opening, the more light comes in, right? But the smaller the number. Smaller the number, the bigger the opening, but the less light comes in. Now this affects two things, very, very important, all right? Obviously, the latter, the last thing I just said, it affects how much light comes in, but the second thing is it determines your depth of field. Who has heard of this phrase, depth of field? Got one? One out of 14, two, three? All right, not too bad. Any freshmen in here? Sophomores, raise your hands. Juniors. How many people have taken photography in the past? Taken photography classes in the past? Got one? And you've still never heard of depth of field. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Not shame on, shame on her teacher. That's what I'm talking about. You should have taught her this stuff. All right. <clears throat> All right. <laughs> it's kind of easy to remember when you get into it, but uh, for conversation's sake, basically, the, the smaller the iris, the greater depth of field. All right, I'll give you an example. Who here remembers watching a, an, a solar eclipse through a pinhole in a box? Has anybody ever done that? Got one person, one out of 14, <laughs> hitting the same ratio. If you take a piece of paper and you, you prick it with a pin, just a tiny little hole, the smallest hole you can get. And you, you take a shoe box, and the open end of the shoe box, you just tape that piece of paper to that shoe box, right? And you, you, you hold it up to the sun or an eclipse or something that's happening in the sky with the sun on it, you'll have a perfectly focused image on the back of that box. Because the smaller the hole, the wider the depth of field. And you've got almost an infinite depth of field. So the, the, the tiny little pinpoint hole that you put in that piece of paper has such a great depth of field that it goes 94 million miles away to where the sun is located. That's called infinite focus, right? And that's tiny little aperture, right? But how big is the number? Huge, right? Because there's like no distance between, you know what I'm saying, right? So the higher the number, the less light you get, but the greater the depth of field. So you get a, whole, a tiny little bit of light, which when you're looking at the power of the sun, you can hang, right? You can, you can handle that. But other factors need to be adjusted because you're lowering that light to increase that depth of field. And we'll talk about depth of field in a minute. Don't worry about it. We'll, we'll get there. Uh, so, so the aperture is measured in stops of light. 
All right, so I told you earlier that the Germans had uh, created this algorithm of measuring the opening and closing of the iris, right? So the way that they came up with it is they had a, um, they figured out how, how much more open a shutter could be uh, to determine how, uh, how to double the amount of light. So every time that your shutter opens up one full stop, you've given it twice as much light, all right? That's how they figured it out. They figured it out, and, and everything else is based on that exact principle, right? that exact algorithm. All the other factors are, all right? <clears throat> so a preset amount of light uh, given to the movement uh, uh, from opening and closing the iris. This is based on a mathematical algorithm of the Germans, I just told you that. All right, this is a much better drawing than mine. Mm -hmm. All right, these are your full stops. All right, from, this is a low end, we probably will never actually find a, a one four camera on, on our budget. <laughs> uh, so it goes from two, to two eight, to F four, to F five six, to F eight, to F 11, F 16, F 22. So these are full stops. And the scale goes like this. <clears throat> the larger the opening, the more light you get. Makes sense, right? But the shallower the depth of field. So an F14 or an F28, right? That's gonna that's gonna give you a lot of differentiation between the, the items that are in focus and out of focus on your frame. Does everybody know what that means? Alright. Who doesn't know what it means? So everybody does know what it means. So I can stop talking. Nobody wants to put their hands up? Who doesn't know what it means? Okay, if nobody knows, if everybody knows, I'm not gonna show you. I bet I could live with my hand up. Alright, so uh, everybody watch this screen here, and I'm going to show you what depth of field is all about. Right. I'm gonna set my camera at an F28. Which is, a, which is as wide as mine can go, right? uh, which is gonna have the shortest, the absolute shortest depth of field. Right. So these, these objects right here are only what? Maybe a total of eight inches apart, six to eight inches apart, right? So if I want a super shallow depth of field at a 2A, Look at how out of focus that other object is. Not even that far back. All right. <clears throat> now I've focused right here where the where that little rim of light hits the edge of my lens hood. All right. So it, it makes that object look like it's a couple feet away, maybe. I mean, really, really far away. Now I'm going to crank up my ISO as far as high as I can get it. And then I'm going to increase my f-stop, which will increase also my depth of field. And now look at it. It looks like it's basically right behind it, right? So you can see how just changing the aperture of your, of your, of your settings on manual mode will give you an immediate avail ability to add distance, which adds contrast, which adds a focal point. At, in, the, in the first image, in this image, you can pretty much focus on anything in that frame, right? You can look at the keyboard, you can look at a marker, you can look at anything, but, but because it's all comfortable, it's all in focus. But in this one, what do, you, what do your eyes stop on? The well, the one that's most in focus, right? So I'll shoot that again. Two way, bring my ISO back down. Now the closest object is not in focus. Right? But you don't want to look at that. Alright, so your eyes want to stop on the closest object there, any object there, and the farthest object there. 
It, you're, you just don't want to stop over here. Right? You just don't want to do that. So how could you use that to your advantage when you're shooting creatively? Singling out objects. Singling out objects. Like what, for instance? Uh, people. Let's talk about people. Let's do this. Uh, two people. Come up here. One stand here, one stand here. <laughs> <laughs> Volunteered, I like it. Everybody give her a hand. <laughs> Alright, so let's say we have um, you're working for a client, and that client is this person right here. However, this is this person's boss. Hmm, tricky. Which one's the more important? Boss. Boss, definitely. The one who's uh, put the paychecks down, right? So in the instance where, where neither of the two, like this one's paying you, but this one's paying this one, you're not going to want to outstage her, and you're definitely not going to want to outstage her on her behalf, right? So in that instance, if I have a scenario where I've got one right here and one right here, say they're like walking up the stairs and entering the boardroom, but the action shot is right here, this is the shot you want. I know, it's going to be nerve-wracking for a second. <laughs> Stay with me here. One good look. Come on, look up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Good stuff there. All right. Now I'm going to ask you to do a warm up. I'm going to come back in a little bit. Right there. Good. All right. Thank you very much, ladies. You may sit. So let's get rid of the All right, so here we have uh, what we're, we have an aperture of F16. All right, everybody see that? And we have, <clears throat> well, I dropped my shutter speed down to a 40th of a second, which is kind of dangerous because if I shook it all when I took that shot, it would add a lot of blur. We don't want that either. That doesn't make anybody look good. Uh, and I shot it at the widest focal length possible, which is uh, the widest angle possible. It's 24 on this, on this lens. All right. So that one at an F16, where, who's going to be in or out of focus or are they going to be out of focus? Which, which, what's the answer there? How big is the aperture on an F16? Is it bigger or smaller than an F2.8? Smaller. Much smaller. The circle's smaller. Yeah, the iris is much, much smaller. All right, so what does that mean for focal length, focal depth, the depth of field? It'll be deeper, right? So let's go back to the other image. If it's a 2.8, what's the, what's the depth of field on there? Is it going to be narrower or deeper? Yeah. Narrower. All right. So let's look at the 2.8. <clears throat> All right. So that one's almost exposed correctly. This one is a little bit overexposed, mm -hmm. uh, but we won't worry about that for now. I've got to do that on the fly. Yeah. So look at this one. Now who's, who's in focus, who's out of focus? Even though she in the back is physically larger than this person, I have made this person look more important than that person simply by putting her in focus. And how did I do that? I adjusted my f-stop to a 2.8, which forced my camera to focus on the most important thing in the image. Right? I upstaged her. Probably even got her fired. All right, so those are my images, right? And look, she's got this nice smile, and she's all worried about it. She's like, I don't want to smile. <laughs> all right, so now, now does everybody understand depth of field and how the f-stop and the aperture change that? Then I have, I have two. Moving on to the next set of slides. We still got on this? Mm -hmm. All right. So, aperture affects how much light enters the sensor and the depth of focal field or focal range. Alright, so this is basically 
a rendition of what we just did, all right? <clears throat> at an F2.8, which is what the original one I shot was, we opened it up to an F11 here. So if you got a, a, a bunny, a kitten, and a tree, uh, and you just want the bunny in focus, and you want to you want to say that bunny, or I'm sorry, the cat, I guess, is the most important thing of all of that shot. I don't care about the tree. I kind of don't care about the little cute little bunny, but uh, we could put them in the frame somehow. So just because they're in a line this way, maybe they're like to the left and right of the main subject, right? Just pretend that we've got a little bit of 3D action going on here. All right. Increasing the depth of field uh, probably more than twice to an F5.6 uh, uh, is what that does there, and uh, more than four times at an F11. All right, That's, that just kind of gives you that visual representation of how deep that actual depth of field is. She in the back was almost out of focus at an F16, right? Almost. But I was also shooting really close and with a wide angle lens, so that, that has a little bit of an effect on it too. All right, we'll probably get into different lenses and stuff in different workshops, but for now, let's uh, move forward with this. All right, so this is what it looks like coming out of the camera. Now let's say that this is the actual size of the iris, right? This is, this is what happens to the light right, as it comes into the camera. The reason that you have a wider depth of field here on a smaller iris is because the light has longer before it becomes focused on either end of your focal point. This is your focal point, right? You want to shoot the, the cat, the bunny, and the tree, right? If you have a smaller iris or a larger f-stop, right, maybe an f-16 for this one, maybe an f-28 for this one, it actually, it sharpens the light into more of a blade look and has more of it available for that focal depth. It's kind of a hard concept to understand unless you look at it with this. So the, the wider it comes in, obviously the shorter it's going to be available in front of and behind the, the subject that you want to shoot. All right, when shooting at higher up stops, it's easier to selectively focus your subject. So as uh, your uh, visual media careers continue, uh, you will hear things like, I want some selective focus on this subject, or I want some selective focus on that object, right? What, they, what they're asking you to do is change the f-stop. Create or remove contrast between objects. So contrast could come in the form of all kinds of different things, right? Contrast can be uh, one is in a focus and one's out of focus. Uh, you could have a, a light uh, backdrop against a dark foreground item. Right? That gives contrast, that makes it stand out a little bit. You can also give, give contrast in distance. All right? So not, not only when I shot the hood and the lens cap here, not only did I add a little bit of distance, optically speaking, I didn't actually increase the distance literally, but I, I selectively focused. And by selectively focusing, I added contrast on focus and distance. Right? Highlight the more important parts of for the viewer. Now that's when the client and the boss come in that you don't want to offend too much, right? All right, ISO. What is ISO? International Standards Organization. Basically, it's the camera's sensitivity to light. You can increase and decrease the digital sensitivity to your sensor's ability to pick up light. <coughs> On a sensor, just picture a flat piece of glass Basically, it's a piece of silicon behind which there are millions of what they call photocytes. These photocytes add up to what they call pixels, and the pixels add up to, to, to all the different little pieces of a picture that stack like Legos. Right? It, the, your camera opens up the shutter, it takes this thing that burns this image onto the photocytes. The photocytes build the image like the little blocks come together for your pixels, and that's where you get, I've got a 40 megapixel whatnot. Right? That's when you get to say that. Uh, so the, then that translates to, it breaks it down into a little code, it sends it through the processor, and then you have it on your card. When you put your card into your computer, then it re-decodes decodes that or reprocesses that signal and recreates that image, right? But it has to break it down first. And that is the job of the sensor. Now they've gotten super small because they fit in your cameras these days, but um, back when I was learning film, you know, 
I started off with a standard 24 by 36 millimeters. That was like a standard camera. What would we call the sensor today, right? All right, the good news is, you know, uh, basically the higher the number, the more sensitive it is. Um, the good news is that it allows you to shoot in lower light situations, like just now. It might not look like it in here, but there's not a lot of light in this room. So I had to really crank my ISO up because I was adjusting to shoot at an F16 when we were shooting over here. All right, so I, I cranked my ISO all the way up as high as it could go. All right, what we didn't see on here is the bad news. My camera's got a really good ability to downgrade the noise or grain, but when you increase sensitivity in your ISO, you increase grain. That's the bad part. There are, there are ways to adjust for it, and the more expensive cameras do generally a better job of getting rid of that grain. But the, the biggest benefit that it gives you is that it gives you the ability to adapt those other two factors with a third factor. That's one of the things that the Germans couldn't figure out because they only had one plate of burnable substance that they could put behind the camera. Eventually they figured, uh, well eventually someone figured out that you could have interchangeable film on the camera itself and you could make that film more sensitive. And finally, sensors have been made more sensitive, right? Uh, but the, the, we didn't always have those first two factors. Uh, I mean, we, only, we only originally had those first two factors. We didn't originally have uh, the abil ability to increase sensitivity of light. Uh, all right. All right, shutter speed. Shutter speed is the last of the three factors that affect manual. And shutter speed is literally the measure of time that the shutter is open, allowing light to hit the sensor before it closes again. This is the one where you have the one over whatever, right? One over 40 is a what? talked you guys into a stupor, haven't I? One over 40, let's bring it back to high school math class. One over 40. One fortieth. One fortieth, I like it. One fortieth of a second, that's what we're talking about. So if I, if I say, uh, if we're talking about um, actual film speed, you know, a lot of guys might shoot a video, the camera settings will ask you if you want to set it in a 25th of a second or a 30th of a second or a 60th of a second. That's how many frames are, are literally being fit into one second. It's the exact same thing when you're shooting normal photography, right? If you could hit one after another, which you generally can't, you could fit 60 frames in a second if you were shooting at a 60th of a second. All right, so why is this important? The higher the number, the shorter, of t the shorter amount of time that, that the, the, the sensor, the mirror is open and the sensor is absorbing light, right? So think about what that means in terms of capturing light, all right? Um, the, the, the higher the number, let's go with the 5,000th of a second. Most cameras, DSLR cameras, will actually shoot as high as a 5,000th of a second or more, all right? And when you shoot at a 5,000th of a second, that's a mouthful, uh, you can freeze anything in front of you. Think about a, a, a bird flying right in front of your camera. Just at the moment that you trip the shutter, it'll freeze that bird right there, right in front of your frame, right? Or a race car, or, I don't know, anything that happens fast, you name it, right? It'll freeze that solid, basically. The lower the number, the more amount of time uh, that that shutter is open, and therefore, if, if you want to add motion or movement to something, you can, if I want to shoot her walking out of the class, for instance, I could have, I could aim my camera at her and follow her, making her basically still on my lens, but everybody else is moving. I, I'd have that shutter open for about maybe a tenth of a second, thirtieth of a second maybe, and, and everybody in front of her would be moving this way, and she'd be completely still, right? Which would give her the movement, even though everything else is what's, what's moving in the frame. If you're, if you're a, a, a horse racing track or something like that, and you really want to make one horse look like it's winning, even though he could be in like third place, right? You take your telephoto lens, you zoom right in on that horse, and you move, uh, you, you follow that thing at the very center of your iris, and, and when you snap it, everything else will be in motion, right? So it's a way you can add life to your shots, even though it's one frame and it's still, it is 2D, right? You can add all this excitement in the background. That's the magic of shutter speed. <clears throat>
All right, so the problem with this is that if you're shooting at a lower light situation, you're gonna have to open up the shutter speed anyway. So it's gonna be harder to collect that motion, harder, harder to make that, that movement happen. Uh, it's also gonna add what they call camera shake. Uh, VR or vibration reduction lenses do a lot to help with that. But um, if you're shooting with more light, you might need to adjust the other settings in order to freeze your subject like you want. So you're gonna have to, if you want to shoot that 5,000th of a second, you're gonna have to turn your ISO and your aperture in the opposite direction right, to accommodate for that. And all of that stuff is balanced right here. Everybody should uh, get a copy of this. Uh, I, should, I should probably just post this on the Facebook or something like that. But this is called <clears throat> this is called the um, the exposure triangle, right? Or the exposure wheel. Sometimes they use a wheel. But this one's called an exposure triangle, right? These are the three factors all in one. Basically, uh, if this one, if your shutter speed goes up and your white balance in a certain measurement, everything else needs to go down to adjust for that. If this one goes up, these two need to go down. If this one goes up, those two need to go down. If this one goes down, these two need to go up. Now we got that? Pretty simple when you, <coughs> when you think about it like that. All right, any questions? You guys are like, at the end of the day, you're like, I just sat through four classes. <laughs> I feel like I just had a baby. <laughs> <laughs> no more class, please. So that's that's the best I could come up with in about a week, prepping prepping that. I couldn't actually find. Some, I had I had some older uh, workshops on on exposure. They aren't exactly manual, but their exposure goes in manual pretty well. That discussion. So did you guys at least learn something? Mm -hmm. All right, cool. No questions then. Everybody knows everything about what I just said and absorbed all the content. All right. <laughs> all right. Well, my, uh, I'm sure we have majors from all different areas of campus, right? Probably some business and probably some maths and some other things. Uh, my office is on the third floor, which they strangely call number two in this country. And uh, it's office number 319. So if you ever want to dish about you know, cameras and stuff. Come back, I'm always there. All right, thanks for putting up with three different classrooms. That was fun. <laughs>